Hello, good afternoon. I'm Martha Hurst, and together with Nick Malowski and our colleagues Michael McCarthy, Anthony Grono, Rebecca Anchetta, and Jahira Novoa, I'm delighted to welcome you to our Fall 2021 University Budget Forum. We thank you for your interest and for taking the time to be here with us. We're delighted to note that over 300 colleagues from across the university are joining us today. Students, faculty, deans, and administrators from every school and college, as well as representatives of the president's office, the provost's office, the Office of Mission Integration and Ministry, Enrollment Services, Student Affairs, Administration, Facilities, Athletics, Libraries, WFUV, Public Safety, HR, IT, and other members of the finance team. Thank you for being with us. Together with the other nearly 20,000 people in our community, we 300 persons, and we're excluding alumni in this part of the discussion, constitute the university's greatest resource, its people. Our next most significant resource, of course, is money. And today we'll be focused on the university's operating budget. Last year, fiscal year 2021, which ended June 30th. This year, fiscal year 2022, which started on July 1, and planning for next year, which will start July 1, 2022. Nick and I will do a presentation and then answer as many questions as we can in our allotted time. Please note too that this program is being recorded for future reference if you'd like, and we'll be getting together again in the spring for another forum. So last year, what the hell happened last year? We wanna remember the context of setting the 2021 budget. The pandemic was declared the first week in March and we began planning for the FY 2021 budget at that time. We had to scramble actually, because we had to get a budget approved in April for the following year. It was prudent and conservative, built on a number of different scenarios we had contemplated and planned for and used our best uh, resources together with our colleagues across the university and the senior leadership team to craft a budget that we thought might work for FY21. And it was daunting. And the uncertainties that existed then rolled out in unanticipated ways throughout the course of the year. And some of them still pertain today. But on balance, when we look back at FY21 from a fiscal point of view, as well as many others, but particularly from a fiscal point of view, we are very gratified by how well Fordham did in managing through FY 2021 financially. Net tuition and fees were higher, and this is all against the budget, right? Higher than budgeted because we had better enrollments than we had budgeted. We used the matrix approach and we picked a series of enrollment numbers that we thought would, would pertain in the course of the year. And in fact, enrollments were not as negatively impacted as we had anticipated before the year got underway. Of course, financial aid was up too, as you can see. Sue to housing, we had no idea how we were gonna be able to, or if we were going to be able to accommodate students on our campuses in the fall of 20 and in the spring of 2021. But in fact, we were able to house many more students than we had expected. We had budgeted for occupying dorms for only half of the year. We thought we might for be for an entire half of the year online and the other half on ground. And we did better than that. And we were able to welcome students back in greater numbers than we had budgeted in the spring. And that was terrific in so many, many ways. Other revenues were lower as a result of having vacant, principally vacant campuses. Parking revenue at only half of the normal year. There were no conferences. There were no summer camps. We have some third party housing programs. Some of you might know that we have housed um, high school students that participate in a New York Times program each summer. And we didn't have any of those sorts of programs at all in the past year. Um, and so those revenues were down. We also had the benefit, as many did across the nation, of federal stimulus funds. In FY21, we received revenue of almost $13 million from HEERF, the Higher Education Relief Funds. So those were some of the key dimensions of the FY21 
budget. All in all, a com combination of better than budgeted enrollments, more housing revenues, and fiscal federal stimulus money that gave us a strong revenue performance that's seen here, unanticipatedly strong. Now I note strong against the budget, but let's look at expenses too, so you understand and recall we had reduced operating expenses very substantially for FY 2021 in order to be sure that we could have a balanced budget. So although revenues were up, there were increased costs of educating and housing additional students increased against the budget. In addition, 50 cents of every dollar of federal stimulus money was granted to students. So first let's look, you see the salary and wage line. We actually uh, expended more on that line than we had anticipated but we were pleased in a way about that because we did not furlough anybody or lay anyone off. We had some higher enrollments. You see the Graduate School of Social Services in particular, our two new enrollments were up. We had um, some uh, additional ex office expenses and equipment which were related to COVID in particular and other expenses, directly office expenses were under budget. Travel and meetings, substantially, way down, of course, compared to what we had budgeted. Nobody was traveling really, except for some essential travel. Utilities up, that was partly a function of the seasonal weather we encountered and also keeping buildings functioning at including higher air circulation and airflow than, than usual. So those are some of the key things. Um, and we would note other operating expenses where you see there were higher meal costs, higher write-offs of uncollected student balances and COVID-19 related expenses. Our contingency was used to cover COVID-19 expenses. It is a reflection of how important it is to have a contingency line in any operating budget for unforeseen circumstances. People do it in their households for unforeseen household expenses, boilers blow, someone gets laid off, some other unforeseen expenses, people need to buy a new vehicle perhaps. Um, and, and in an institution such as ours, a contingency is really critical too. Think about, uh, it, it was mostly capital expense, but think about the flooding we encountered this past early fall with the hurricane. So you see the expenses that we had that were substantially up in comparison to what we budgeted. The result of all of this, we ended the year with $7.9 million operating result. That is actually an excellent outcome for us, uh, given all that we encountered last year. And so it's interesting to look back at the, the three years prior to, uh, to this year to think about what occurred. FY21, we had a lot of unpredictability. We budgeted very conservatively certain circumstances broke in our favor. If we had had to stay online all year, this would have been a very different picture. If we were still online largely, we would continue to have that picture. Uh, but we were very, and if we hadn't gotten the federal stimulus funds that we got, it would be also a very dramatic other picture. So we ended the year with some revenue. You'll recall that we one of the things we did on the operating expense reduction side was to uh, curtail the university's contribution to the retirement match. And uh, we did that for five months. We resumed the match payments in April and we have been able to, and we'll talk about that in a second, I think, we've been able to uh, restore the payments that we had needed to withhold last year um, and just in early, November, people received the first half of the payments that are uh, to be made back to people who had had their payments curtailed. Uh, and we were able to do that in part because this operating result for FY21 was stronger than we had imagined. So it is telling, and it's one of the reasons why when we're planning future operating budgets that we talk about budgeting conservatively and always having a contingency in our budget. FY19 to 22, we want to focus a little bit here because it's interesting to look back at the three prior years as we are looking at this year's operating budget. What's striking is the growth in different categories of revenues and expenses. Tuition and fees are up nearly $75 million over the past three years, but that's only 10% in growth. 
Financial aid, of course, is up 27% over the same period, and understandably so. Financial aid is rising faster than tuition, and it's a major dilemma that's not unique to Fordham, but it's symptomatic across the higher education sector. It is an expensive proposition that we uh, educate students in higher education, and every school balances affordability and access in different ways. And here at Fordham, we do our very, very best. And you see what a priority it is for us that financial aid grows at the rate it has. We don't have a lot of other substantial revenue sources. It's very important to remember this as we go forward and people clamor for funds in our university. The lion's share of our revenues come from student fees, tuition and fees and room and board. We have some revenue from research, sponsored research. We have some revenue I mentioned previously from parking and from conference services and the like, but they're really insignificant. And you can see the revenue sources here. Uh, student related sources, almost $800 million before financial aid. And then the other revenue sources, very, very modest in comparison. So you see the challenge, I think, and we have this challenge every year. We want to maximize financial aid to our students. We want to be efficient about our expenses and delivering the quality education that Fordham delivers and enhancing that quality. And the challenge is all about the relationship between revenues in and expenses out. One more takeaway here that expenses are up 12% over the same period here. And they're still growing a bit quicker than our top line tuition revenues, but it's nothing compared to the growth that we have in financial aid, again, largely by design. The FY22 budget and our forecast for it. Just a quick peek at this year. Here we show the board approved budget from this past April compared to our latest forecast from September 30th. There's really good news on the enrollment front and most of you know it. So we welcomed our largest and most ethnically diverse first year class in Fordham history in September, at least as far as we know. We welcomed a first year class that's comprised of nearly 44% students of color. We're thrilled about that. And overall, we have an additional 750 first year students on our campuses. We, and it's really good news. Also, due to the positive experience we've had mitigating COVID 19, we're able to operate not at the 89% housing occupancy we budgeted, but closer to 93%. That's almost 100% occupancy because there's always a vacancy factor. And we did leave a little room in our planning, which student affairs did very, very carefully as they do every year. But we left a little room for isolation and quarantine if we needed it. And so there is good news on that front as well. We spend more of our federal stimulus money last year than was budgeted, which means we have less to spend this year unless we get another stimulus package, which is unlikely. And we'll come back to the federal stimulus discussion in a few moments. Our budget this year is also supported by the carrying forward of the $7.9 million operating margin that I referenced on the prior page. We carried it over from last year. And it's enormously helpful when we have the opportunity to do that. And we were able to do it. We also had a transfer from our capital budget of some funds into our operating budget and some expenditures from our strategic initiatives funds. And that is allowing us to be able to balance this budget in a positive way. Salaries and fringe benefits are higher, principally because we added contingent faculty to help us support the additional students, which translated to over a hundred new sections in the courses offered across the university. And employees received a slightly greater salary increase than had been budgeted. We had been budgeting thinking we'd have to give a more modest increase and we had the opportunity to give the salary increase that people had expected and that we had hoped to be able to plan for and we were able to do that. So we see the operating budget is just about balanced. It's got a bit of a contingency and it's got a little bit of money on the bottom line. But this is essentially a balanced budget. And I would point something out here. This is a balanced budget at still a more modest level, a more modest level of expenditures than several years ago, because we are working our way back from the pandemic and we still have a lot of unknowns. So we, this is not, we're not back to normal yet, as we all know, 
the Delta variant is around, COVID activity is a little bit up this week around the city and around the nation. Um, and it's gonna be up and down and we have to react to it in a lot of different kinds of ways. Um, so this budget is still rather modest uh, compared to what we would wish it to be on the expense side. Nick's gonna talk a little about the federal stimulus money and then we'll come back to talking with a little more particularity about FY22. Federal stimulus money came to us in three different tranches. So the table at the top will show you that uh, we received something called the HERF-1 money, the HERF-2 money, and then HERF-3 money. When you add it all up, that adds up to about $42 million of federal stimulus funds that we began to use in fiscal 20. Uh, we used again in fiscal 21, and then the balance we will be using in, in fiscal 22. And the tables at the bottom, and there'll be other tables later on that I, th I think help paint the picture, just to illustrate the importance of those stimulus funds to the university's budget. The table at the left shows revenues and expenses as they're actually reported, 21 and fiscal 22. To the right side, we can see what would happen to those same numbers were we to remove stimulus from both revenues and expenses. So you can see for fiscal 22 as an example, where our revenues are slightly more than our expenses, at least for the moment, were it not for the stimulus funds, we would be facing a, a budget shortfall of nearly $10 million at this point. So it's very important to uh, understand the importance of it. And also, as Martha pointed out, it is unlikely that we will receive another stimulus package. And so to the extent that the university has been enjoying um, the, the generosity of these stimulus grants, it also demands that we focus on how we're going to replace those stimulus funds with either additional revenues uh, or uh, expense refinements as we move forward. Thank you, Nick. We wanna spend just a minute focusing on this year, the forecast for this fiscal year and comparing it to FY 2019, which is sort of our last normal, if you will, full fiscal year. We already discussed a few slides ago and don't wanna belabor it, but you can see in very direct way on the slide that our expenses are exceeding our revenues. And although we have a very, very complex, you know, over half a billion dollar operating budget in our university with lots of complexity, in the end, fundamentally, this is at the heart of any budget. Revenues need to exceed, or at least be equal to, but in our case exceed, expenses. And when they don't, we have the challenge of finding either new revenues and or reducing expenses. That's a critical factor and is not gonna inform us on in our discussions going forward about FY23. Um, and we're gonna look at just one modest example because lots of people ask about it. It's modest in dollars, but important to many people. Nick is gonna just speak briefly about travel and meetings as an example of the kind of experience that usually happens in an academic year and hasn't happened in the past two years, but we'll get rolling again, we hope, as uh, things move forward and we get back to some kind of new normal. Sure, thanks Martha. The, as, as Martha pointed out, the travel and meetings number is not a big one, but it is near and dear to a lot of folks. And, and very oftentimes it's viewed as, as an indicator of opening up or, or shutting down. And as we begin to sense that things are opening back up, uh, and as we're noting that meetings are becoming more in-person uh, and also that uh, travel, particularly air travel, is becoming safer uh, to many folks, the questions do come up about travel. And this slide is important for two reasons. One, it shows what our last normal fiscal year travel budget looked like. And you can see that we have uh, in 2019 spent $16 million in travel expenses split between these, these three areas as you see here. And the other important thing this shows is that we are restoring travel expenses as is critical to the mission of the university. Um, we have not restored them back to the levels that we've seen pre-pandemic. Uh, we still have uh, some, some fiscal challenges that we have to navigate very carefully. Um, but, but just to show everybody the, the, the standing that we have in front of us at this point, 
In 22, we have a budget for travel expenses of about $10 million. And you can see that in every category, we've uh, increased our, our travel budgets. We're a little bit down from fiscal 19 for athletic travel, but for um, academic travel and for administrative travel, we are a little bit up. Um, so we do recognize that it is uh, important uh, and that it is mission critical. Uh, we want everyone to understand that we are restoring it as is absolutely necessary, but you can see that we still are not able to anticipate or expect the same level of expenditure that we would in a normal year, which for us <laughs> was three years ago. Yeah, I'd add one point there, and that's simply that I ask everybody on this call to think about this this expense area just a little harder than usual. We're all anxious to get back to conferences and to get back to seeing colleagues and presenting papers. It's it's important in the academic realm. It's important for administrators to be able to get together with colleagues uh, in their respective fields. Um, but there's still a lot of uncertainty. And so uh, I hope people are thinking hard about travel and wondering if there might be one more year when uh, travel can be less significant than it routinely is. Th this is left up to every individual uh, department and division, but I just make that note. I know that the conferences I usually participate in in person, I won't be attending. I, there'll be a virtual opportunity and I'm going to utilize that, I think this year, um, just to see where things go. And hopefully uh, next year, there'll be a lot of comfort around being able to easily and without too much restriction, travel in the ways that are appropriate for our institution. Okay, so fiscal year 23 and beyond, we're already planning and many of you are involved in this and we thank you in advance for all the work you will be doing as well as some of you, the work you've already done. We begin thinking about the fiscal year 23 budget really in the summer. We are, our division is a division that always lives in three fiscal years. We finish fiscal year, 21, and we're doing an audit on that, usually as we did over this past summer, the auditors come in. We're living in fiscal year 22, and you're all helping us manage the budget of this fiscal year. And then we're planning for next fiscal year, and that work has already gotten underway. Uh, so what's on our mind as we're planning for FY23? Well, first and foremost, we want our financial priorities and decisions to help support implementation of our strategic plan. Um, and you all, I think, are familiar with it. Uh, it's got a lot of dynamic work underway with respect to it. And some of those initiatives will require resources that we need to plan for. We're very soberly watching inflation. It's rising in a way that it hasn't in years. Uh, less so for services but, and more for goods as the supply chain issues persist. They're COVID-related. There's lots more demand for products than there was supply. There are also supply chain issues getting products where they need to go. There's wage growth around the economy, particularly the domestic economy, and that will result in some impact on the services side. Um, and so future jobs reports will help us predict labor costs, but we are seeing some inflation already uh, in this year's budget. And um, you know that it's up over 6% right now uh, and that's remarkably higher than it was last year at this time and under two, I think, maybe two and change. If any of you saw on, uh, in the TV press over the weekend, um, the Fed Secretary Janet Yellen was on, some of the Federal Reserve chairs of the regional areas were on, all talking about this inflation um, and all indicating the expectation that Inflation will be up for the, the lion's share of calendar 22, um, and maybe we'll deflate next year at this time, but there'll be a, a glide path that's not steep with respect to inflation. So we have that expectation and need to build it into next year's budget that our costs will rise for no other reason than the price of everything is rising. Anybody who started their you know, shopping for a Thanksgiving holiday can notice. Anybody who's putting gas in your car can notice um, in your own households and in your own lives. Um, and so pricing has risen remarkably on a number of products and it spills over on, in every way. Utilities are a big, and energy costs are a big share of inflation. Um, 
overall, and that's a problem that's global and will need to be dealt with on a global basis. But luckily at Fordham, we have some utility contracts that are locked in for another year or so. Um, and so we're going to mitigate some of the utility cost increase that we otherwise would have had. And that's a credit to our facilities and administration team to have anticipated that and work with providers and government officials to, to lock in some of the contracts uh, in a hedging sort of way. The new campus center, um, it's going up, it's beautiful. The portion that's finished is magnificent as some of you have seen, the facade is wonderful. It's gonna be such a dynamic addition to our Rose Hill campus. But it also results in more operating budget expense beginning this next year. <coughs> Excuse me. We will have the expense of operating the campus center. We will need to start paying back the interest on the bonds we use to finance the building of it. And then we have a depreciation element in our budget. And once we're starting to use the facility, the portion of it that's being used, the depreciation expense will be associated there. So that's a significant addition to the operating budget. And as exciting as it is, it's a real expense, over $10 million a year, and we've got a budget for it. Nick talked about the federal stimulus funds before, and they were a tremendous boost to us over the past two years and some this year. Uh, we don't have any expectation that they will be available to us this coming year. The result, and last year, you all know this, I think, we did not raise the undergraduate tuition rate. Generally, each year, we raise it um, a little bit as costs go up, even in a non-particularly inflationary time. Um, and last year, I think appropriately so, we held the tuition rate at the priory this year, actually. It's, it's the tuition rate for fall 2021. We made the decision last year. Um, and we'll feel that decision this year because as you know, the, the tuition rates build on, tuition builds on the rate from the previous year. And so we have sort of foregone revenue from that lack of increase, albeit important, albeit important, the reality is though, fewer dollars came in than otherwise would have. And so this year we have rising costs and more dependence on student source revenues and no federal stimulus money. It's really the federal stimulus dollars that enabled us to not need to raise tuition last year. I predict we're gonna to need to have a tuition increase in the coming year. We're gonna be in conversations with the senior leadership team of the university and the board of trustees about that in the coming weeks. Um, and from where I sit as chief financial officer, we'll need to have a modest increase in the tuition rate. Now, you know, that's the sticker price and we'll continue to support students with significant financial aid. But nonetheless, I can't think of a university or college around that isn't raising its tuition this year or that raised it last year when we didn't. So it's one of the realities of the time we're in, the lack of federal stimulus money going forward and the inflationary cycle that the economy finds itself in. We'll wanna be retaining the first year class this year. And there may be some of you on this call right now who are members of the first year class and we're thrilled that you're here. We wanna retain you here. Um, and it's a large class and it will be key factor in planning for the FY23 budget. And then at the end, we are maturing an all funds budget approach, which Nick will speak about towards the end of our presentation. So those are some of the key things that are on our mind as we're planning for FY23. We want to go back and focus for a minute on the and this list of priorities. And, and I'll ask Nick to talk about the strategic plan and some of the elements of it that are very important to us as we go forward. Thanks, Martha. Uh, so depending on the size of your monitor, you can either read or not read what's on the screen, but I wanted to mention a few buzzwords um, that, that come out of the strategic plan um, and, and, and think about that in the context of the financial planning phase, uh, financial planning environment that we find ourselves in right now. One, reviewing the curriculum. Um, developing interdisciplinary programs, technological and built environments, examining those environments, improving them, enhancing them, multimodal teaching, external funding, um, particularly uh, in sponsored research, STEM and the disciplines and the equipment and the faculty that go along with it, learning technologies, high performance computing, new sources of revenue, retention and graduation, and of course, infrastructure. 
Um, these are all elements of the new strategic plan that we have. And given our financial planning environment, um, you know, there, there could be a couple of schools of thought. One would be, we can't do any of this stuff because we don't have the money to do it. On the other hand, I think what is uh, important for all of us as a community to understand and subscribe to is that we have to look at our strategic plan and direction. And we have to concentrate our efforts and our dollars around the things that uh, are going to attract students to the university, make Fordham a global competitor uh, in higher education, and perhaps most importantly, ensure a robust future for this university. So in a zero sum game environment that we have here, it's important to look at all of our activities through the lens of which of our activities and the dollars that we're applying to them are in the highest and best use of those resources. Uh, so just one thing, again, Martha said this is on our mind as we go through our financial planning meetings with deans, vice presidents and others, we are focusing on these topics. Um, and we hope that uh, as a community, we'll all be giving uh, due consideration to all of the important initiatives that are coming out of the strategic plan. Some new academic programs that are coming out, very exciting. You can see some of them here. I won't enumerate them, but a lot of these are geared toward uh, student demand and, and what students are interested in these days. And it's very, um, uh, it's very gratifying uh, and very satisfying to see that all of this activity is taking place. And I thank all of the uh, faculty and deans and the provosts and everyone who's involved in accrediting these programs and so forth for making these uh, advancements. It's exciting. Um, a PhD in computer science in particular is a very exciting move for us. And we're delighted to see those things moving forward and, and building for the future um, driven by our strategic plan. Um, Nick mentioned the PhD in computer science. And I just want to note that the lion's share of government sponsored research is in STEM. And so our provost, a scientist himself, is very focused in this area, as many of our faculty colleagues are. And it is exciting to contemplate that we can begin to grow um, STEM initiatives at Fordham, not only to attract dynamic students and faculty, but also that there might be even greater opportunities to um, compete for some government-sponsored research grants. So I just wanted to make, make that note, and thanks for highlighting it, Nick. Our next slide just identifies the, the key importance of inflation rate and the importance of it to us. Um, it's gonna trend down, we, we think, as I mentioned before, at the end of next year, uh, but no one knows for sure. And the implications for us are, are many. Things are delayed, certain goods and services are delayed and will cost more and the delay will cost us more. Um, and we will be using, we predict, some of our contingency this year, and we'll need to plan to build in inflation into some of our costs next year. So we have our eye on this. It is a very key dimension of the, the planning work we're doing. I mentioned the campus center before. Here you see um, our new campus center will add about almost $11 million to next year's operating budget, about $2 million to operate, $5.8 million in interest, and $3 million in depreciation. Ordinarily, we might've had the chance to plan a little for some of those added expenses in the past two fiscal years, but as you know, there was a global pandemic and that kind of got in our way. Um, this is the stimulus slide I alluded to earlier. This takes a look at three different fiscal years, 20 and 21, and of course, 22, the year that we're in now. The black bar shows you the total revenues that we reported which obviously includes stimulus grants received from the federal government. The red bar at the right shows what those revenues would have been without the stimulus money. So without belaboring the point, we can see that uh, the $41.6 million of stimulus aid that we are employing in our operating budget um, this year and over the past couple of years, as it fades away, we're going to be faced with challenging decisions about how to rebuild our revenue base um, or to recalibrate our expense base to make sure that we can operate in a post-pandemic uh, environment without this type of, of uh, federal support. And then as it goes, uh, all funds budgeting, uh, just a, a brief aside, 
Um, if you are a budget manager, you're probably familiar with the all funds budgeting approach um, that we've been exploring over the past few years. The premise of this is that we want to, as part of our budget exercise, think about all of the sources of funds that come into the university and all of the uses of those funds coming into the university. In particular, sponsored research and donor funds. Um, donor funds uh, are obviously contributions that come in from donors and they serve a lot of very important purposes uh, with respect to the um, academic programming that we have, academic chairs, scholarships for students, um, and, and myriad other purposes around the university. Uh, sponsored research, our grant portfolio, uh, typically has not been something that we've seen budgeted for in our operating budget, but by introducing those things into the budget, we'll be able to have a much more holistic view on everything that comes in and everything that goes out and are we using all of the resources that are available to us in the highest and best way? Nick, thank you. Your mention of the donor funds and incorporating that budget into an all funds budget approach makes me wanna mention two other things. One is um, Fordham's endowment. You've all heard about it. Father McShane referenced it in the state of the university remarks. Um, and we're thrilled that we had, as many others did this past year, a very, very successful year with respect to our investments. And the endowment, Fordham's endowment, got up over $1 billion for the first time ever. Um, and that is great news. There are many schools with which we, our peer and aspirant schools, as we call them, which are the schools that our students um, apply to in addition to Fordham. <coughs> Applicants to Fordham also apply to a number of other terrific schools. Many of them have endowments way larger than Fordham's. Fordham was a school with some humble beginnings and didn't start with fundraising. Although it's almost 200 years old, it didn't start with substantial fundraising until much, much later in its life. Um, and so we're sort of playing catch up in some respects. So huge for us to be at a billion dollars and that's enormous. Um, I think you may know and that um, only a portion of those funds are part of the operating budget. And, and uh, you could see it in the operating budget this year, about almost $12 million, I think. Um, a portion of the funds are restricted and a portion are unrestricted. And we take a percentage of the unrestricted funds and make those funds available to the operating budget. So it's it, it, you know, it's people think, oh, a billion dollars. If you take, you know, 40 or 50 million dollars of that into the operating budget, can't, can't you do that? Um, no, the, the endowment is intended to be a legacy for the long term history of Fordham University. Um, and we have a spend rate that's guided by the Board of Trustees. And so a portion of those funds come into the operating budget. But the extent to which there's the, the endowment grows, of course, does a lot of things for us. It tells the outside world of our fiscal health. It helps us enormously, the strength of it, when we are going out to borrow money, such as for the campus center, or to refinance some of our bonds, which we just did these past two weeks because we got a lower interest rate and so we were able to refinance them. Um, so it tells the outside world a, an important measure of our fiscal stability. Um, and it also does, as it grows, increase the opportunity to grow a little bit the uh, investment funds that are in the operating budget. So everybody wins, every portion of our world at Fordham wins if we have a strong uh, endowment. The same is true of, of, we have a number of our development colleagues on this call today, and I don't know how they found time out of their work to be able to join us. I'm pleased about that, but they're very, very busy. There's a new campaign, which I think most of you know has kicked off. And it is largely about the student experience in myriad ways. And that fundraising is critical to us. Uh, and Nick alluded to that too, talking about donor funds. Um, it is a way we augment the work of the university. It's a way we plan for the future. And it's a way, most importantly, we can lend additional financial support to our student body. So those are two key things. With respect to the endowment, perhaps early next fall, our budget forum will focus a bit there. We have our chief investment officer, a guy named Eric Woods, some of you knew him, um, retired just this month after a number of years at Fordham. 
And so we're, we're, we've embarked on a search and by probably mid to late spring, we'll have a new chief investment officer working with us. And so perhaps in the fall, we'll have a presentation about the endowment because I think it's an area that can, is sort of mysterious to a lot of people. And it feels like to some, well, isn't that just a big honking savings account? And why can't we draw that down at hard times? And so it would be important, I think, for the community of all of us to have a keener understanding of the endowment. So I think we'll try to plan for that for next year at this time. I think with that, we will stop. We thank you for your attention to this presentation. Um, and we will begin to answer any questions that have come through while we've been talking. Uh, we have a couple of questions related to inflation. Um, one of them is more general in terms of um, how will inflation impact our operating budget for next year? Uh, and one more specifically related to inflationary increases uh, in the context of salaries and wages, and will there be an impact there? We do uh, expect to make room, some modest amount of room in our operating budget for inflation, that as we're starting to map out operating expenses for fiscal year 23, we are needing to include some uh, inflationary factors in almost every area. So yes, including salaries and benefits, including other operating expenses. So we'll have to build in additional, likely additional expenditure in almost every line of the expense side of the operating budget, except those that are already locked in. For example, interest rates are interest rate. Um, and we're gonna calculate what we're, our best thinking about inflation and, and build it in. But of course, what are the implications of that? The implications are that our expenses will grow even if we don't add any new bodies or equipment or people or supplies or um, any other things. If, if we had just the circumstances uh, that we have this year, it'll cost us more next year. And so that's why I focus on the very simple reality of revenues needing to grow bigger than expenses, faster then expenses grow because we've got, in addition to every other concern and wanting to add expenses that are strategic, costs are gonna go up. So that's one of the reasons we ask everyone to be especially mindful, and people already are at Fordham, people manage their budgets very well, but this is particularly a time, and next year will be too, of thinking twice about making sure that we're making the best decisions at the smallest level to the biggest about how we use our resources so that we are um, really being as prudent as possible. Thanks, Martha. Um, mm -hmm. There's a question of uh, how are departments being mindful of their expenditures to reduce departmental expenses and how is that being monitored to prevent waste? Um, we spoke a little bit about um, expense management in the context of travel and meetings um, that obviously pertains to um, all manner of office expenses. I will say that um, there are several, um, I'll call them controls in place that we have to help individuals uh, manage their <laughs> expenses. Uh, one of them is through, uh, right here in finance, our Office of Strategic Sourcing, uh, which uh, is involved in securing competitive pricing. Um, a number of uh, folks around the university received an email from uh, our director of strategic sourcing and myself, Diana Lujaraj, and, and, and me um, about uh, supply chain issues and all of the uh, issues that go along with them, not the least of which are increased pricing. Um, so if you are experiencing challenges with finding the right prices, or if you do have concerns about the ability to manage departmental expenses in light of uh, increasing inflation, please do reach out to us. Uh, we're at extension 4950, um, and we'd be happy to, to help you with that. Um, apart from that, um, there is a, a very rigorous budget monitoring uh, apparatus that we have in place. So we do pay close attention to budgets, um, and we do work with folks uh, if they are having challenges with respect to to spending. We have a question about when we'll revise restrictions for international travel. Um, and we are working on that together with the provost office. Uh, and so stay tuned there because we're hoping to be able to make 
some revisions in our approach uh, very soon. There's also a question about the other half of the retirement benefit match. I think everyone knows, as I just said, that the first half of that payment uh, back uh, occurred in the last payroll. Um, and I don't have an answer to the question of when you might expect the other half. We have uh, in our agreement that uh, we have an, another fiscal year to be able to do it. Uh, and we're hoping we'll have the opportunity to make that second payment within this fiscal year, if, if we're able to. So stay tuned on that score as well. We, it would be our objective to return it as uh, soon as we're able, and, and we're not there yet, but stay tuned. Okay, um, if inflation is higher next year. The, the, one of the issues with inflation, um, and we have a, a few economists uh, on the line, um, uh, one of which, one of whom is not me, but uh, if we do go above uh, 2% inflation, we would obviously have to account for those inflationary costs in our operating budget and, and have to make probably some tough decisions around what are we going to invest in and what are we going to perhaps defer to, to future years. There's also the question of inflation, whether it's temporary or, or permanent. Uh, if inflation continues to rise and does not come down heading into the next couple of fiscal years, uh, we will have to make different decisions then, for example, if the supply chain begins to balance itself out and supply increases and uh, prices therefore come back down to reasonable levels, we'll make a separate set of decisions. So it's a little bit early to tell where we're going to be, but certainly um, our budget will reflect whatever inflationary increases we believe we will experience during that 12 months. We have a question about tuition and will the hike go beyond a, a sort of usual 2% rate and an appropriate note that, of course, tuition rate hikes are always challenging for students. And of course they are. This is one of the dilemmas of the nature of our work. We provide services to students and the cost of providing those services uh, is the cost of providing those services. Um, and so we try to be as efficient as possible. Some of these questions gave rise to that. We all try to be as efficient as possible about our work and about the expenses we incur in doing that work and in managing the university broadly and specifically. Um, and at the same time, the reality is that the costs of running the university need to be accounted for and that the lion's share of our revenue derives from students. So it's absolutely the challenge that every institution of higher education is grappling with right now. Accessibility, affordability, growing and strengthening the university and juggling those sort of competing uh, elements to come up with a path that is the most appropriate for us. So I don't know yet what the undergraduate tuition rate increase we will be proposing will be. It's somewhat mitigated by the fact that last year there was no increase, but whenever we need to do this, we're very mindful that there's an impact as the cost increases in every household are, are significant and index and, and, uh, and, and noted. Uh, question about some of the places where faculty or students may have absorbed the cost of certain cuts over the last year, and are there plans to reinvest in those areas? One of the observations that we made uh, as we were going through the cost-cutting process, part of which was, was uh, quite painful, frankly, um, uh, but some of which wasn't so painful, and that was the fact that some expenses reduced organically as a result of our operating remotely uh, in a lot of cases. You know, for example, the travel and meetings budget that we just looked at Last year, we spent $1.6 million on travel and meetings. In a normal year, we would spend somewhere around $15 million. There was some need for travel that had to be uh, deferred to future years. But for the most part, uh, there were travel restrictions in place, which precluded us from doing that. So I wouldn't say that there were too many costs, cost reductions that were absorbed by um, our community, although there certainly were some. What other sources of revenue will be actively pursued going forward to try to relieve the pressure on only tuition and student fees? Um, 
I alluded to some of this. Uh, we'll continue to advance the, the auxiliary services I spoke about, including conferences, camps, and all that sort of stuff. We're building up the STEM aspects of our curriculum to be available to students, but also, as I noted, to be able to compete for additional sponsored research. And so that's a long-term game plan, but it's a very important game plan. I think also there are discussions underway with the School of Professional and Continuing Studies to offer a number of programs um, of a different sort to um, other markets of students. They might be employees in one sector of our economy, for instance, healthcare workers who might whose employers might be wanting to augment their education and their certifications and their qualifications and offer some particular programs to them. So those sorts of initiatives are underway. And also we're going to look to some partnerships with the private sector um, and see what the opportunities are for some of our uh, corporate partners. We have many relationships with corporations in and around the city of New York. It's one of the best things about Fordham being here in New York. And also graduates of the Gabelli School, our, our business school has enormous relationships uh, in all sectors uh, of the economy. Um, and so partnering up with some tech firms and some business firms and other firms uh, to help us support programs at Fordham, maybe there's research that would be interesting for them to have us do and interesting to us to do, um, and maybe underwriting some programs for students. Those sorts of partnerships are ones that are getting looked at in a very dynamic way. Questions about um, the, the presidential search and uh, the cost associated <laughs> with uh, a new president, if that president is in fact a lay president. Uh, that, that's, a, that's one of the considerations that we have to uh, include in developing our budget for fiscal year 23. You know, that, that additional compensation cost um, will, will be part of the uh, budget process that we are uh, beginning now and will be moving through the winter with. A couple of questions about uh, outlook for being able to spend more on hiring and on facilities. And at the moment, we don't have a path to being able to grow spending for significant additional hiring or for additional facilities. Not that those are not urgent matters, but that the budget picture we just outlined demonstrates that we're still working our way out of this pandemic era and that next year's budget, as I said, just with inflation, just taking this year's budget and adding an inflation factor grows the expenses in it far exceeding our revenues. Um, and that's why I'm speaking about a tuition increase of some kind. Um, and that won't necessarily cover all the need either. So at the moment, the outlook for additional hiring, new hiring, spending on facilities, it's a challenging outlook. And you can, on the academic side, speak with your, and I'm sure you are, your departments and your deans and the provost's office and know the challenges there. That said, however, we don't ever stop. This is not a new challenge. Every higher, institute, higher education institution has this challenge. And we don't stop planning, engaging what the opportunity is for doing those things. We may not be able to do as much as we would wish. We may not be able to do much in this next fiscal year, but perhaps in the next several fiscal years, we're going to be able to do some things. One thing we know, of course, as if, for example, we have the opportunity to hire up, even to replace some individuals who are leaving and they're in critical positions we have the expectation that we may need to pay a little more than we previously had paid to replace people because of this wage growth factor that I spoke of earlier. Another question here um, about graduate student pay. Um, I think this question uh, is related to Martha, an answer that you gave earlier on, you know, the various inflationary pressures on all of the different expenses that we have. Um, that will certainly be a consideration. Um, a grad student pay will be a consideration, much like you know all of the other elements of our operating budget and the the inflation that's experienced. But again, there are a lot of you know very 
uh, expert economists out there who are still debating whether the inflationary pressures that we see now will be temporary or permanent. So we're still watching the space to make a determination as to how exactly this is all going to impact our budget. Another question is, is, a, is a good one. I'm uh, the first woman in three generations of my family not to be a nurse. And the question is about the shortage of nurses across the country, which there's a, uh, several big articles in today's papers and the last several paper weekdays about the nursing shortage and nursing burnout and nurses in facilities now that just have to keep on even as their staffing shortages are keen. Are we looking at bringing on board a nursing program? Not to my knowledge, a nursing program would be terrific. It's also expensive um, because of all the labs that are involved and the, the specialized faculty that are involved. So we don't, to my knowledge, have any plan uh, with respect to a nursing program, um, it's an interesting question to raise with the provost, I would say, but um, just on a personal basis, given the number of nurses in my own family, I would be delighted if we had that opportunity. It's an incredible, important profession. The biggest threat to our university budget for the next couple of years is a really interesting question. The biggest threat is always really if enrollments fall off. And the uncertainty there, we haven't experienced it. In fact, we had the opposite challenge this year. We, we had the delightful and unexpected, a third more students in our incoming class than we had budgeted or anticipated or planned for. We think that speaks to a couple of things about Fordham. One is our enrollment services team did an unbelievably beyond first rate job in converting to virtual recruiting and uh, welcoming um, events for incoming students and their families. So I think lots of people had a fairly seamless introduction to Fordham, but for being unable to sort of be on the campus uh, and visit in the usual way. Two, um, we went test optional and we think that invited many students who are qualified to be at Fordham, but felt that our SAT score averages were perhaps daunting compared to theirs. Um, and many of those students applied and, and were able to be admitted to Fordham. Three, New York City. Uh, I came to New York City as a 19 year old to come to school. I didn't know anything. I didn't know anybody. I just knew I wanted to be in New York. And I think there are lots, maybe some of the students on this webinar, lots of students on our campuses who are thrilled to be in New York and just excited by all the potential that's here and that Fordham takes advantage of um, and introduces students to. And so, so that happened. So we think we can understand to a degree that we have this tremendous uptick in students this year, but do we know that will be the case next year and the year after? We don't. So one of the uncertainties to me that I pay a lot of attention to is especially in this sort of new world order around the pandemic is the unpredictability. You know, international students are now able to come back to our schools and colleges in a big way, but you know, in one fell swoop, they couldn't come last year. In fact, some of our colleagues who um, are from other, whose families perhaps are in other countries and went back to their countries to be with their families during the pandemic and then couldn't come back for the longest time. All of those things, are unsettling to me and, and the most unsettled aspect. We, we wanna be able to welcome students and plan for that every single year. Will we need to make another adjustment to department budgets in FY22? Boy, I hope not. Um, if inflation runs rampant, it's, I guess it's possible, but we're ho really hoping not. Budgets are already pretty constrained and I've heard some anecdotes from people about departmental budget challenges. I'm hoping we won't need to make another adjustment in this fiscal year. I'm not showing any more questions, Martha. Okay. Well, it looks like at least people's questions for the moment um, have been answered. Uh, and should you have any others that occur to you in the coming days, um, many of you we work with on a regular basis. And so we'll perhaps have a chance to talk about these issues more substantially in our ongoing conversations. Many of you are involved in planning for your own program or department or division or school uh, 
budgets for FY23. So you're already immersed in that. And as I said before, we thank you once again for that work. Others of you perhaps not, but if questions occur to you, you're welcome to drop us a note. And we thank you very much for joining us today. Thank you very much.